Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. I want to talk to you this morning about a problem with a lot of Christians. Many Christians today compare themselves among themselves. This is one of the reasons why so many church of our uh, people in our churches think they're not such a bad Christian. They feel, you know, I'm not doing bad. I'm better than Joe over there, you know. I'm not like him. And, you know, I, I go to services. He, he's, he only goes twice a month. I go every week, you know, and we start comparing ourselves. You know, and uh, I'm not as bad as, as the other guy. Why? Because we're comparing ourselves with other Christians. A commentator, commentator puts it this way during the time of the Apostle Paul. He says, in a sense, the Judaizers, now, uh, for just to refresh with the Judaizers, Judaizer was a Jew during the time of Christ that came to know Christ. Okay, but they went and lived under the law instead of under grace. So that's what a Judaizer is, okay? So in a sense, the Judaizers belong to a mutual admiration society that sets up its own standards and measured everybody by them. Of course, those inside the group were successful. Those outside were failures. Paul was one of the outsiders, so he was considered a failure, unfortunately. They did not measure themselves by Jesus Christ. So what I want to bring to you this morning is how do we measure ourselves? So what is our standard as a Christian? The Apostle Paul puts it clearly in our text this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. That, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of men's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judges me is the Lord. Paul tells us that his standard in his life is God. It's God and what he wrote down in Scripture. He does not care what others think as long as he's following God's standard. Now I want to be careful that you understand what I just said. He doesn't care, and we shouldn't care, what other people think of us as long as we are following God's standard. That's the key to that. Now, why am I saying that? We should care if other, what other people think if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Then we should be worried. And other people, because other people look at us and judge us. It's just like... One of the guys I keep bringing up <laughs> that always says, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want nothing to do with it. And how many times we have acted outside here, uh, maybe at an A-bait meeting, maybe at a bike night, maybe at a poker run, and we've acted the way a Christian shouldn't act. And people are watching us and observing us. And, and they say, well, you know, he's supposed to be a Christian. But they don't tell you that. But that's what they say to themselves. Or maybe say to their close ones. A lot of times we are not honoring God in what we're doing in our lives. And that when we don't honor God in what we do, someone sees that. You know, Facebook today. It just blows me away what people say and do on Facebook. I mean, they opened their whole life. What to me would be private, they're telling everybody. It blows me away. It's almost like, oh, by the way, I just want you to know, I'm going to be gone Monday. I won't be back into Friday. I will be out of state. So if you want to rob my house, go right in and rob it. Exactly. No one's going to be there. By the way, the alarm is off, too. If you need the code, it's, uh, it's uh, W-O-R-D. <laughs> and, but the sad part is, we see that. And people say, keep saying, this is a Christian. That guy professes to know the Lord. He, he's always saying that, you know, I love God. Oh, God's good and all. 
And we go, something doesn't make sense here. The problem is we are not comparing ourselves or, or, or we are, uh, you know, comparing ourselves with other Christians, and we don't live up to the expectations of what God wants us to live. First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty says this: Where is the wise? Where is the scribes? Where is the disputers of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? All our thinking is foolishness when it comes. To pe- compared to God. And what did we say earlier? What our greatest enemy was? Is ourselves. We get out there, we want to do what I want to do. And you know what we do? We end up messing up things, is what we end up doing. And a lot of times we think, you know, we're not so bad. Why? Because we compare ourselves with someone else. I'm doing at least better than what they're doing. And our wisdom in that type of thinking is foolish. God's way is always the best way, and his thinking is above our thinking. This is one thing that can happen when we do compare ourselves with others. Here's a good example in Luke chapter 18, verse 11. This is a perfect example. Let me explain while you're looking at that. You had the Pharisees. You had the Sadducees, or they're called scribes as well. And then you had the publicans. They were the three groups of the Jewish people. Uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees or the scribes were basically the upper shalon. The publicans were the lower, looked down on people that were on welfare or whatever, okay? Couldn't make it at all. Or the hard workers, you know, the slaves. And li- listen what this guy says now. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even at this Republican over there. He's even pointing to the guy over by him, this Republican. He's comparing himself with others instead of comparing himself with the standards of God. He's not comparing himself with God at all, and he is not what he thinks he is. He might say, you might say, I would never do that. But the fact of the matter is, we get caught up without thinking into that type of thinking. I always tell people this. Pharisees are not born into this world. A Pharisee becomes a Pharisee. Good Christians slowly become Pharisees. Not all Christians, but that's what generally happens. Someone gets saved or what? That's what the Judaizers, they got saved. They were heading the right direction and then made a bow face and started living under the law. And we, the moment you think you're not, oh, I'll never do that, it's going to happen. It's going to creep up on you. The end result is we will be judged by God's standards, not ours. And you better get that sunk into your brain today. Because everything you do when you walk out of here and Glenn doesn't see, it doesn't matter whether Glenn sees you or not. What matters is God sees us and judges us according to his standards and his rule. And those who are not saved, they will have their judgment seat with God's rules and his standards. And their judgment seat to the unsaved will determine how much punishment they will have when they go to hell. That's what their judgment seat is going to be all about. How much punishment? There'll be degrees of punishment in hell. But remember, once in hell, always in hell. You don't get back out. You don't work your way to good. You don't get a 20-year sentence and then get paroled. It's for all eternity, never to change. And we that are saved, we have our own judgment seat when we get to heaven, which I've spoke of before. And we will go before God with his standards and his rule, not ours. And I'm going to give you a very, very big verse, a good one, at the end of this message that will talk about this, but I left it at the end for a reason. God's standards will come out on top whether we like it or not. So let's see what else Paul says here. Paul does not compare himself with others, but he goes even further. 
Paul goes as far as to tell us that he does not even examine his own self. Look back in, in 1 Corinthians, our text there on the paper, chapter 4, verse 3. But the second half of verse 3 says, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judges me is the Lord. Paul's standard is the Lord, and it is what God wants him to do, and not what he thinks he ought to do. It is what God thinks of him is what's important. What God thinks of each of us is what's important. It's not what we think of ourselves. Paul does not examine himself. Now listen to what else he says there. When he says, I know nothing of myself, this is an interesting statement. In the Greek, this is the way it comes out. Paul means... He cannot see as clear as God can see himself. Think about how much truth that is. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that. I cannot look at myself and evaluate myself as good as God can that looks at me. Because we're weak. I'll give you a good explanation. (laughs) We go to the mirror every day and we look into it. And we look into it at least once a day, if not more. And every time we look in there, we go, you know, I'm not as bad. You know, I'm fairly good looking. I think about my weight. And I sit there and look at my stomach. I do. I'll be honest with you. I sit there and I start going, you know, it's not quite as big as I thought it was. And every day I look at it, guess what? My stomach's getting smaller and smaller. Not really, no. But do you understand what I'm saying? I convinced myself, why do you think we call it vanity? We see things there that are not true. We got to watch out about God's standards. And not our own. We have many things going on up here in this brain. And to really think clear enough to examine ourselves, we can't. We can't think clear enough. Are we not commonly blind to our own faults? Think about it. Be honest with yourself. We are. Uh, Are we not prone to overrate ourselves? Sure we are. Listen to what MacArthur says. Men are all inclined to try to solve their own problems and fight their their battles by their own ingenious or uh, in their own power. But the human, the power, and only gets in God's way. Men's own efforts hinders God in his work rather than helps him. Who's our worst enemy? We are. Guess what I tried to share with Tom this morning? I said, Tom, think about your life. I've seen you both ways. Now tell me if you don't see that too. And let me tell you, it's hard for him to look at himself during the time when he's at his lowest. But I've seen my life the same way. And I think all of you can relate to the same thing. And Tom's seeing that now. See? The question is, do we respond? Let me tell you a little bit, in a kind of like a small pause about the Corinthians church. You you may be aware of this, you may not. The Corinthian church was the worst church mentioned throughout the Bible. It was a lousy church. Everything went wrong in the Corinthian church. So if you ever want to hear about what not to do, you turn to 1st and 2nd Corinthians and start reading it. And one of the problems that they had there was that they have self-appointed apostles. (coughs) What's wrong with that? You can't be apostle unless Jesus Christ calls you personally, in person. That's what an apostle is. So we have people today that say they're apostles. But that's biblically wrong. 
because Christ doesn't walk the earth anymore. But then they, I don't know if they say this, but the, the only explanation I can come up with is God spoke to me in a dream. Well, we know that doesn't exist anymore. It did back then. But we're in a different time period now. We're in a dispensation of grace. God wants us to live by faith. That's what we're trying to study in our Bible study. You know, it's one thing to say you have to have faith, but I hope in our Bible study we're going to really learn what faith really is. They were self-appointed. And you know what they did? They were comparing themselves within themselves. And Paul was an outsider. They didn't like what Paul was doing. So Paul was what? Didn't meet up to their expectations. When in essence, Paul was doing everything right. He was far above them. But see, they were so blinded in themselves that they couldn't see. They're looking in that mirror. And they see things that aren't there. Paul was always content. Think about this. If you read enough of the epistles, you're going to see that Paul was always content with where God had him in his life. Paul was happy when he was in prison, in chains. When he was in house arrest in Rome, he sat near witnessing to everybody, to the guards and everything. He witnessed in prison to the, the guy that came in. Thought he was going to commit suicide because they thought they were all going, oh, we're still here. And the whole... The guard, his family, and his house all came to know Christ. Paul was never down about anything. And didn't we not talk about that with Joseph's life just recently? The same thing with Joseph. Look at these people that are in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 that we can read about. There's such an encouragement, these people that did what they did. Paul focused on the excellence of his life rather than how successful he was. He focused on the quality of his ministry rather than the quantity of the ministry. You know, I would love to see 30 or 40 people come here every week, but that's not what's important. What's important is that every one of you, not some of you, but every one of you grow closer to God. That each week you're closer to God. And that you examine yourself and say, am I where I need to be in the Lord? And I'm going to give you a couple things to ask yourself at the, at the end. Focus on what God's doing for you in your life. On the changes that are taking place in your life. And it should be changes. Every month there should be changes in your life if you're seeking God. Or are you simply saying, I'm a Christian, and you come... To, to the service and you, and you go and you think you're satisfying someone. You're not satisfying God and you think you're satisfying yourself because you're looking in that mirror too much. Become all you can be for God and pray to God to help you grow and never be content where you're at. Never be content. Don't let grace keep you from growing. Did you ever think about that? That grace could actually keep you from growing? Now what do I mean by that? All our sins are forgiven. The moment you got saved. All the sins for the future are forgiven. But we have a problem. We still sin. It's already forgiven. But as I told you before, the more sin gets in our lives, the further we get away from God. Fellowship gets broken. Then we confess our sins, we get it back. Not, it's already forgiven, but we're just cleansing ourselves. Not cleansing ourselves, we're asking forgiveness. We're acknowledging that we've sinned to keep that close relationship. And we, it's an ongoing thing that we have to do every day. But my goal is, and I hope your goal is, to be as close to God as possible. Why? Well, number one, I like that hedge around me. I don't know about you, but I like it. I like the way God blesses. I've made less money in my life right now than I did before I went into ministry. I used to make three times more than what I'm making now in my own business. I, I, I did very well in my business. And, and yet I, I actually got more now than I've ever had in my business. And my wife and I, we just sat down all the time and go, this doesn't mathematically work out this way. <laughs> 
But God has a way of doing things. I, re- I still remember the ball field back in Ferndale, looking out and watching one of my friends that was in my class go down on a sportster, just happened to see him go down the street, and saying, gosh, I wish one day I'm going to own a Harley. And then I ended up for him at one point. Four. And I'm going, gosh. It amazes me. And, oh, by the way, I may have said this before, but I don't remember if I did. Before I had my first Harley, I had a 350 Honda. And I determined that since I'm never probably going to own a Harley, I was going to make that Honda look like one. And because I had all this fabricating stuff, I started cutting, I stretched the front end, I stretched the rear, made it into a hardtail, got rid of the shocks. I had it looking so close to the Harley that from a distance, all the Harley guys were waving at me. I sat 20, 25 inches, yeah, seat height. I had Harley seats on it, Harley fenders, Harley handlebars. And all on it, I converted all, painted it. I mean, it really looked sharp, but it still had that 350 engine. I even went to Pete Hills and got the universal Harley mufflers. And if you reverse it, it will fit the Honda exhaust. And then I gutted it out, and I went to a muffler shop and got a... Because I know exhaust always goes to the outside. I don't know if you're aware of that. But as it comes down, it's always fighting to the... That's what exhaust does the, the, with the waveform. So what I did was, and that's where a glass pack works. The glass pack leaves it wide open, no, no back pressure, but they pack it with uh, fiberglass, and you have holes in it, and that, uh, the wave goes in through the hole into the fiberglass and gives you that low tune, and you have no back pressure. Well, I made my own glass pack, see? I gutted that out, got a pipe that went in there, put a set screw in. I drilled a lot of holes that like to wore my hand out. And then I didn't have fiberglass. I went in my house and got fiberglass out of the wall and packed it, stuck it in it, and it worked. And it sounded rougher than what it really was. But like Fat Boy just said, when you got close enough, the hands went down real quick. <laughs> and, all. But, but, and I finally remember going up the road one day and saying, God, I don't know if I'm ever going to own a, a Harley But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be content where I'm at right now. And this is no joke. Three months later, I got my shovel. And that's a miracle in itself. But what I'm trying to get at is, God never ceases to amaze me on how he works when we are working hard to be where we need to be as a Christian. You can't just, it says the word diligently seeking him. You can't, Passively be seeking God. You've got to be diligently seeking Him. How do you act when you leave here? How do you act when we go to the, to the uh, A-bait meeting? Or when we meet at a, uh, a poker run or someplace? Or bike night's going to start coming up, uh, what, in a couple weeks? Well, bike night will start. And, uh, and I go down there most of the time and uh, hang around to try to, to witness and invite people to come to our stuff. Listen what it says here in Romans chapter 8, verse 8. It says, So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Please understand that. When you are in the flesh doing what you want to do, you're never going to please God. You're never going to please Him. You may be doing good, but you're not pleasing God. When we sin, we do it in the flesh. So we do not... Need to, we do need to be around other Christians, though, to challenge us. There's a big difference in comparing myself with someone and saying I'm not as bad, but there's another difference when you come in here and you share a testimony and encourage me because I see God working in your life. That you want to look for. You want to see God working. And so you can be encouraged and go out and say, hey, God did it for them. He can do it for me. That's why I love testimony so much. That's why, you know, I thought there was going to be a preaching service last week. But see, Danny was going to do, uh, he had gotten back from a a mission trip, and he was going to do something there. But I'm glad he had enough wisdom to stop, because I tell you, it turned out perfect just the way it was. 
and God really worked. We can be an encouragement to others. We can look at others for an encouragement. So the end result is, we will be judged by God's standard. We will be without excuse when we get in heaven and when we give an account for our lives. So now, it's time to start living the standards of God and never compare ourselves with others here on earth. Now I want to ask you, well, I'm going to ask of you to ask yourself three things you need to do this daily. Probably more than daily. But here's three simple, short questions you need to ask yourself. Number one, am I where God wants me to be? You need to ask yourself that every day. Are you where God wants you to be? You need to ask yourself that question. Number two, is God glorified by my life each day? Is God glorified by my life each day? Number three, can Christ commend my daily activities? Will he be proud of what I did the whole day today? Not just this morning, saying, oh, well, I went to church, but how you act in the next hour, two hours, when you go ride someplace, or you go to dinner someplace, or you meet some friends later on, how you act around them. Something God taught me a long time ago at bike night when it was over at Hooters. It was right after I had the accident going to Myrtle Beach where I ran into a deer. Uh, it was probably a couple weeks later. And, and you know how guys get together. There was about five or six of us in a circle. None of them were saved but me. And what was interesting was somebody started talking about an accident that they were involved in. Well, what did that do? It led to another guy that had a similar accident at some point. And he had a story. And then the other guy had a story. Well, eventually got to me. And I brought up the story of about the hitting the deer. But here's the interesting thought. God taught me something very valuable that night. I was, they were all unsaved people. I gave my story and left God out of it. Deliberately. You know what I'm saying? If I came in here and told you the story... God would have been in it. Oh, God did this for me. He kept me from going down. God protected me. God, uh, you know, I, I was able to finish the trip, even though I hit the deer directly. And, uh, and I didn't go over the handlebars and I, I, on and on. But when I was talking to them, God was not mentioned at all. When I got on my motorcycle and was heading back to the house that night, God spoke to my heart and said, Why would you leave me out of that conversation? And I, I'm not joking you, I got so convicted. It hadn't dawned on me that way. It just, as stupid as that sounds, it didn't occur to me. And I said, never, ever will I do that again. And I realized that's the part of witnessing. When I go to Abate the next moment and someone starts talking about something, God will be in my conversation whether they understand it or not. Doesn't matter. God's going to be in my conversation every moment, every day. I'm going to live my life through God. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. This is the verse I promised you. I hope this verse will hit you as hard as it hit me in the years past. While you're looking this up, Paul is talking to Christians, so you understand what this verse is talking about. He's talking to Christians, not to unsaved people. So just be aware of that. And I'll explain just a tad about it after I read it. Every man's work shall be made manifested, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall be tried, every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abideth, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If every man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. This is referring to us going to our judgment seat and the works that we go there, what we did while we were here on earth, all the things we did is going to be tested by fire, by God's standards, by his rules. 
And if what we did, we did to bring honor to God, we're going to get rewards from it. But the ones that don't, because we did it because we wanted to do it, that we weren't honoring God, we weren't living the way we were supposed to live, it's going to be burnt away. But yet he says, and I want to clarify this, I gave you this verse specifically, he shall suffer loss, but he shall be saved. You don't lose your salvation, but you'll lose everything else. You'll still be in heaven. But the best way I can put it, you'll be a bum up there. I don't know. I don't know how to relate that to, to bring it to. Your works are going to be tested. There's other verses in the Bible that tell us whether the things we did were good or bad. Everything, we will give an account. It won't keep us out of heaven, but we will give account and we'll get rewards or not get rewards. And that's what he's talking about here. And he was clear to say, we're not going to lose our salvation. But you know what? When I'm before God, it's bad enough when I'm before a judge. But when I'm before God of the universe, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be scared. When they bring up some of the things that I've done in the past, I'm going to be ashamed. I hope, I hope, there'll be more good than bad. But you know what? You have something going on right now. You can change your life and do what's right. So when you get to heaven, God can say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. As Paul says, that's what he looks forward to the day that he did. All you got to do is be sold out. You may not be an apostle. You may not go around you know, raising the dead or any of that other stuff. But you can be all you can be for God. But you're going to have to diligently seek him. This is not a game. You don't play Christian. If you're a Christian, be serious about it. Don't compare yourselves with other people. That will do nothing but draw you away. Are you going to be serious? That's a question you need to ask yourself today. Let's pray. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.